23 to 25, Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, we continue looking at what is man or what are we as human beings created in the image of God, fallen through sin and ultimately through Christ for his people redeemed by grace. So Genesis chapter 2, in verse 23, God has just created first the man and then from the man he has taken the woman and it's as God brings the woman to Adam that he says verse 23 then the man said it this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and mother <clears throat> and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So now Father teaches things that we need to survive in this culture, to see clearly, to understand both ourselves as we are created, and our need as we are fallen, that we might, through your redemption, live to the praise of your grace for Christ's sake. Amen. If you've read this week's pastor's word or the thing I put out on Rockport News, you know this is going to be another one of those parental advisory sermons. By that I mean there will be things here that could very easily, and in fact I hope will provoke discussions between parents and children, the kind of discussions we really need to be having in a culture like this. And the obvious question for a message like this would be, well, why focus on this? Why why focus on a topic like sex, intimacy, and marriage during the morning sermon when we're all gathered together? Don't we get enough of that from the world? I mean, it just seems like it's everywhere. But, but of course, it is everywhere. And that's the reason that we have to look at this from a biblical point of view. <clears throat> I can't think of any other area where our culture of confusion is doing more damage to people, to families, to your children and your marriage <clears throat> than in this area of sexuality. It is everywhere, but it's everywhere in a way that is toxic and damaging both to individuals and to society in general. <clears throat> in fact, if you think about it, our culture has become radically schizophrenic in its view of sex. It both obsesses about it as if this is the only thing that matters in life, while at the same time it is very dismissive about it, as if it's no big deal and can be exchanged with someone as casually as a handshake. The result is a deep confusion about what it even means to be human, or male or female, and not just a confusion, but a deeply harmful and destructive confusion. And that is why we need to think clearly and biblically on these matters because the Bible has a lot to say. And so some of this may be a little uncomfortable, but stick around because there is grace here. And if, if you're someone who begins to feel the conviction, perhaps from past sexual sins, again, stick around because there is grace here in the gospel for every sinner who believes. And so to do this, let's begin, first of all, looking at the beauty of God's creation and the good that he intended for, for this thing we call sex or sexuality. And we need to understand that God created sex as something good to foster deep intimacy within the marriage union. And if you want to know why sex exists in this world, here it is. God made it for marriage and for the establishing of intimacy that can only exist in marriage to bind two people, a husband and a wife, together for a lifetime. And oh, by the way, in his mercy, it also creates children. In fact, that's one of its big reasons as well. And it brings those children by his design into a secure environment where a husband and a wife, again, committed exclusively to each other, can jointly care for and nurture those children into adulthood. Now, that's the big picture of God's good design for sex that we see in this passage. 
Because let's look at it. Let's look at several things. First of all, <clears throat> we must understand that everything in the Bible demands that sex only exists for the context of marriage. Anything outside of that context is by definition sin. For example, look at the order of events here in verse 24. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast or be joined to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh. I like the poetry of the King James. It says, a man shall leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. But, but notice the leaving takes place before the cleaving. And, and these are words that are full of both marital and sexual significance. It's covenant language, in fact, as God himself is pronouncing his purpose for these human beings that he has just brought together. It describes, in fact, what takes place at and then after the marriage covenant. And so at first they're apart. The man lives with his parents. They don't cleave together yet. They aren't intimate physically and in fact, in the wisdom of the Old Testament culture, there were clear safeguards to make sure that they were never together. It was, it was, it was, it, it, when it was functioning the way that they intended it to, it was very almost impossible for them to come together. But then on the wedding day, they come together in celebration with their families and with the village. And the man leaves his father and mother behind and takes hold of his wife emotionally and relationally, yes, but also very clearly physically. He takes hold of her in the intimacy of the marriage union. And then just in case we didn't get the picture, <clears throat> verse 25 makes it plain, and the man and his wife, they were both naked and not ashamed. And so there is a, there's a beauty of intimacy in their union as described here. Something that is good, something that is healthy and joyful between them. Now they are unguarded in each other's presence as they come together in the act of marital intimacy. That, that's the image here. And it's only after that marriage takes place and the union between them takes place that we then read in Genesis 4 verse 1... And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. And so brought together physically in the act of marital and sexual intimacy, they now begin to produce children. But the order here in this passage is very important. First, their marriage. Only after the marriage comes their intimacy. And then out of that intimacy, there come children. That is the picture of God's good design throughout Scripture. And only by understanding that design can we come to receive the blessings God intends in this relationship. Which brings us to the second thing to see here then. To understand that in Scripture, the goal of sex is a lifetime of mutual intimacy in marriage not just a personal experience of ecstasy for myself. Now, I need to explain that. But, but this is one of those areas where our culture has so corrupted God's good design and bent and twisted it into something that is now damaging and harmful on a huge scale. Our culture, you understand, views sex as a means ultimately of personal fulfillment, of personal ecstasy, I do it because it's fun. I do it because it feels good to me. And so it's up to me how and when and with whom because it's all about my ecstasy, my feelings, and who are you to tell me what I should do with my body? But God designed sex as a means not merely of personal ecstasy but of marital intimacy of drawing a husband and wife together into a deep and deepening lifelong union that they share together with no one else, that they enjoy together with no one else so that it binds them to each other exclusively for the whole of their lives. And, and so the, the picture here is that what God has created as a good within marriage, the culture has corrupted bringing the chaos we see now. But look at the language here, and again, you'll see God's good purpose. Even the language is just so full of 
things. First of all, it says that they, <clears throat> they are to hold fast to one another. Verse 24. One version says they are to cling to each other. King James says cleave to each other. But, but it's a word in Scripture that, that is often used to describe a covenant commitment of intimacy. I am exclusively bound to you and you alone. It's used in Deuteronomy chapter 11 of Israel's covenant commitment to God. Deuteronomy 11, verse 22, God says to Israel, do all that I've commanded you. How? By loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, and holding fast to him, clinging to him, cleaving to him. In fact, you often find this in Scripture. The very language used of the marital union in its intimacy is really there to point us to a greater union and intimacy that is ours with God. And so just as Israel was bound exclusively and spiritually to God in love, so spouses must be bound exclusively and intimately to one another in love. Second, he says, in this union that he has created for them, he says, they are to become one flesh in a way that lets them be naked and not ashamed. In other words, they come together in the, in the, in the intermingling of their whole lives and of their bodies, one flesh, in a way that leaves them not separate individuals anymore, isolated from one another, but joins them together into a depth of life, a joy of shared intimacy between the two of them. And it says when that happens, they are without shame in their nakedness. There's nothing for them to be ashamed of now. This, this is good for them to be together because they belong to each other. Now, part of the background to understand how powerful the statement that is is to recognize that throughout the rest of Scripture, the term nakedness is almost always viewed as something that is shameful. It's a sign very often of God's judgment. I will leave you naked in your sin, of, of humiliation before others. Jesus hung naked on the cross because he was bearing our shame. To be naked in Scripture, is to be exposed to the shameful stares of others, to mocking and humiliation. But here, and here alone, their nakedness is not a cause for shame. It's a reason for joy. It's a picture of the unguarded intimacy they now share exclusively with one another, drawing near in body and soul to one another as God created them to do. third thing we see here of this intention of God in this intimacy within the marriage bond is that they are said that they, it says that they come to know each other with a depth of intimacy. Very common in scripture. First place we see it is Genesis 4 verse 1. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain. Most of you are aware of this. Scripture uses this term to know someone very often as a euphemism for sex generally within the marriage union, a few places otherwise. But mainly, and when it's used otherwise, it's used in sort of a, a disregarding way of, of, of how something has gone wrong. In fact, most of the time when the Bible talks about a, a physical coming together that is not marital, it uses a different term. It uses the term to go into or, or the term to lie with and, and strips it of this relational intimacy that it is a part of the marriage bond. But, but clearly, the physical relationship is what's in view here, right? It, it doesn't mean Adam studied his wife and learned some things about her. And, oh, by the way, she also became pregnant. No, it says he knew her. It's a term of intimacy of knowledge. He drew near to her in the context of their marriage relationship. And, yes, it was physical to be sure. That's how she got pregnant. But it was much more than just physical. It was, it was, it was a part of a greater picture of drawing them into an intimate relationship. That's the point here. In fact, it is no surprise to you to learn that this same word, to know, in the term of a relationship, is often found in Scripture about our coming to know God and our knowing of Him and our drawing near to Him in a spiritual intimacy. And so here, Adam knew her. And so biblically, sex has significance in Scripture as a form of knowing another person, of binding to them in a covenant of intimacy. 
And, and so in the context of marriage where it is designed to be kept and protected, it means a, a drawing near to one other person and knowing them in a depth and in a way that no one else knows them and in a way that binds me to them and them alone. This, by the way, Christian, is why we as believers can never follow the secular world in viewing sex as merely a biological function or desire. You know, something I do for me, an urge I need to satisfy like hunger. You hear it spoken of this way, but, but do you hear how selfish that is? If you see sex in those terms as the world does, then you will abuse other people. You will use them for your own gratification. You will use a spouse for your own gratification just to get what you want. But biblically, within the marriage context, sex is not about getting, it's about giving. Notice how the emphasis here is not on himself, but on her. He's not drawing near to her and going to her to satisfy some urge or just to get what he wants and she's just incidental to the whole process. He is drawing near to her with the goal of knowing her, the goal of knowing her, of expressing intimacy with her, of bonding with her in a way that is exclusive and satisfying and life-giving and affirming to both of them in their marriage. And so the goal of God's good design for sex is not just personal ecstasy, but shared intimacy in marriage. A, a growing intimacy that I am privileged to share with no one else but my wife if I'm a man, and no one else but my husband if you're a woman. So that through years of mutual care and learning each other and drawing near to each other, we grow in an intimacy of relationship that keeps binding us ever more deeply together. That's the beauty of God's design here. And that must be our goal. Not just a physical relationship, but a coming together in an ever-deepening mutual bond where he cares for her and she cares for him. And of course, men and women, we, we experience that differently, don't we? Men and women, we, we feel our need for one another differently. Our desires are, are, are differently by design. And so part of this mix is that each one of us must focus on the other, not merely on myself. Because again, this is a thought that has helped me over the years so much. You are striving for intimacy with a person, not just ecstasy in the bedroom. Now, this is not the time or place for a bunch of advice here. But what it does mean is that, dear one, you have to be patient with your spouse. You have to come with the, with the, with the goal in mind of giving yourself to a person, a sister or brother in Christ, of, 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 being, of, of being with the way you love them in the total package, not just this area, a, a benefit to them and a blessing to them and to helping them grow in intimacy with Christ as well as with you, striving to learn how to better serve and care for them uh, in this and every other area. And my point is this takes a lifetime. But one of the awesome secrets that our world has totally lost is that lifelong intimacy with one person where you are committed to learning and knowing that one person and no one else is the key to far greater joy over a lifetime than promiscuity can ever begin to offer promiscuity. And those of you who've experienced in her past, you can testify to this. It is empty and shallow and vapid. And yet a lifelong of marital commitment to one another is full and lush and beautiful. That brings me to the third thing, the fourth thing here. And that is to understand then that according to the Bible, there are holy joys built into marital intimacy that we are meant to enjoy to the fullest. In other words, we're meant to enjoy one another as husbands and wives. We are meant to take delight in each other physically, emotionally, relationally. 
Now, that joy can and sometimes is broken through sin and selfishness. Can we talk? But when it is broken, we must repent. We must seek the forgiveness of our spouses because our goal is this intimacy on the whole scale. But, but God designed marriage to include this joy a physical intimacy as a part of, not all of, not all of, but as a part of the depth of intimacy we're to enjoy together. Three passages illustrate this. The first one is found in Proverbs 5, 15 to 21. You can turn there, or just I'll read them here. Proverbs 5, 15 to 21, don't blush. God is speaking here to men above all. And he is, he is speaking to them of the necessity of an absolute commitment to the wife of their youth, the woman he has given them, so that the whole of his life is aimed toward uh, faithfulness and satisfaction with her as a woman. And so he says, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Poetic language to say, be faithful to her only. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets... No, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now he gets down to business. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders, God ponders all his ways. Now, the point that I want to make in that passage, uh, to men especially, is I want you to notice how this is an intentional choice on your part. He does not say, you will automatically be satisfied with her body and intoxicated by her love, as if that's her job to make sure she provides those things. No, no. This is a command to you. You are to see to it that you are satisfied with her. You're to let that be your aim and your purpose. For myself, that means that I, I very consciously ask God to give me a delight in Amy, to bend my mind and heart and emotions and desires for her only, to let me be satisfied with her as my wife as we both grow old. Uh, to, 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 it's a goal to strive for as you consciously set your heart upon her. Let her be that person. Second, we see this in places like, well, the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon in the Bible is indeed a love poem showing the goodness of marital intimacy. Now, it has other reasons, and I've heard wonderful sermons about seeing it as a picture of Christ's love for his bride, but that only works because at heart it is a poem of love uh, d depicting the goodness of this relationship. So it begins with these vibrant words in Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And then it goes on from there throughout the poem with these strong passions and deep longing that the couple feel for one another. And all of it is portrayed as good and right in the context of their marriage that is coming. Now, at first, as you read through the poem, you'll notice they are not married. So they have to restrain their desires for one another. Several times in the poem, you have a warning like this, don't awaken love yet. Don't awaken love until it's, it's time, until it's ready, meaning until they're married. But then when they are married and they do come together, there is joy and ecstasy as they give themselves freely to one another. Chapter 5, verse 1, the man says, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. This is not a prudish portrayal. In fact, read it sometime. But overarching, it is a story of the care and joy that they express toward one another, affirming each other. Just as there ought to be that same kind of care and joy in our marriages, but listen, here's the point, something we have to work at through the whole of our lives. And that's why third... 
we come to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 to 5, and we find that husbands and wives in the New Testament are commanded to be intimate with each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 to 5, Paul says, speaking to Christians living in Corinth, a city rife with sexual promiscuity, a city so, so famous for it that to call a girl, a Corinthian girl, was the same as calling her a prostitute. And so in that culture, he says to them, listen, men, women, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so husbands and wives, he says, belong to one another and out of love give themselves to one another in intimacy. Now that doesn't mean, guys, I always have to say this to us, it doesn't mean that you get to use this passage to demand sex from her. I mean, that is not what it is saying. Not by a long shot. In fact, if I heard of one of our men doing that, I really would want to rebuke your socks off. Because that's not loving her. That's not putting her first. In fact, you'll notice in this passage, there are times that they do refrain. Specifically, he says here for prayer, but, but, but in the Old Testament as well, we, we see a man needing to be sensitive to times when refraining is the best way to love her. Sometimes, sometimes guys, she is tired from chasing your kids around all day. Or she's pregnant or she's on her cycle. And that's where you get to love her with your self-control. But the point is, let's get back to what he's saying. The point is, don't make a habit of depriving each other. Don't use sex as a weapon against each other. Because you know that this world around us provides too many temptations for you to shatter this precious intimacy God has created for you. So we work at maintaining and deepening godly intimacy, which, again, remember, is more than just physical. But it includes it. So God created sex for marriage as something good to bind us together in marriage in a lifelong mutual and deepening intimacy. But it is the breaking of this clear connection between sex and marriage in our culture that has corrupted sex and brought about the destruction we see at work in our lives and in the lives of this culture. When you separate these two from one another and make, and make it merely physical with no uh, tied connection to marriage, that's when the destruction begins. Let's, let's look at that. The Bible makes it very clear that by separating sex from marriage, sin has corrupted it into something selfish and destructive. God made it for marriage. Man in his sin has separated it from marriage, bringing the chaos and destruction we now find around us. I mean, think about it. Think about it. If you take something designed for good and misuse it from its purpose, the result is often devastating. A gun in the hand of a soldier protecting you from the terrorists is a good thing. That same gun in the hands of a five-year-old running around pulling the trigger indiscriminately is a horrible, destructive thing. And this is why the Bible speaks so strongly and clearly about sexual sin. Not because the Bible is prudish, but because this sin is so devastating to us as human beings. We are sexual creatures made by God to express our sexuality within the covenant of marriage. But when we take it out of the covenant of marriage and set this powerful gift loose outside of marriage, the consequences are devastating. Let me just give you a few passages from Scripture that demonstrate this. First, we have to understand that because sex is so powerful a force in our lives, any misuse of it very quickly produces idolatry. Romans 1.21, go ahead and turn there. We'll, we'll be in the New Testament now. Romans 1.21, the Apostle Paul 
demonstrates this solid link between idolatry and corrupt sexuality. Romans 1 verse 21, he says, For although they knew God, human beings knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, morally irresponsible, the word means. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals. They, they, they stopped worshiping the creator and began to worship the created stuff. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Putting all that together, we were made to know God. We were made to be intimate with God spiritually, like a man is intimate with his bride. It's a very common theme throughout Scripture. We are to know him and be faithful to him and committed only to him. And yet, in our sinfulness, we've refused that intimacy of commitment to God. We've gone our own way. And part of going our own way is the misuse of these bodies he created for us sexually. You see that connection here in a couple of places. Verse 24, as they're turning from God into idolatry, he says the result is they dishonor their bodies among themselves. Again, in chapter 26 and 27, he says that dishonoring and self-worship leads to deeper sinfulness. God gave them up to dishonoring passions. Their women exchange the natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, to nature uh, lesbianism. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, homosexuality, committing shameful acts, shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Stark, bold language. But the whole point of it is because they began to worship themselves, God gave them over to a corrupted sexuality of self-worship. We as a people became sexual idolaters, worshiping our bodies and living to satisfy our lust for personal ecstasy. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. The result all around you is a culture of sexual idolatry, a culture of sex seekers who care only for the feelings of ecstasy, divorced from the intimacy of marriage so that marriage becomes optional, unnecessary, discarded, and tossed aside. The result of such a culture is the sexual idolatry that leads to broken marriages, constant adultery, rampant promiscuity, pornography, homosexuality, prostitution, sex trafficking, child abuse, and on and on, all bringing great suffering. When God is dethroned, the only thing left is the cult of personal ecstasy which corrupts everything. Societally. Second, personally, the Bible says that the, that the abuse of sex in this way brings destruction also to our personal lives because we sin against our own bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. Paul warns, again, these Corinthians in that culture they're living in, and he says to them, Do you not know that the one who is joined sexually to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Our bodies were made for God, verse 13 says. They were designed by God for a purpose. Part of that purpose is that we would keep them from sexual immorality and be faithful in marriage. And so any misuse of this body sexually outside of marriage is by definition here immoral, wicked, sin. 
The word used here for sexual immorality is the word pornaya, where we get our word pornography. It, it means any sexual expression outside the marriage covenant. So it includes a boyfriend and a girlfriend who are sleeping together. It includes all forms of adultery, prostitution, all expressions of homosexuality and pornography and abuse. And notice what he says. Here, here's the thing I want to point at. Not only do the, are these things sin because they violate God's will, but they are specifically the kinds of sins which bring harm to your own body. They are the misuse of the body God has given you. Therefore, they are bringing destruction. Why? Think about it. Why? Because you were made by God to use this body for His glory. So what you do with this body matters. Contrary to what many believe, you can't separate your body from you. As long as you live on this earth, your soul is intertwined with this body, and, 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 and it will only be separated at death, but that's temporary. One day it will be reunited to a resurrected body. And so you are intertwined with your body in a way that, 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 that is very deep and very lasting so that everything you do in this body has consequences. That's why sin matters. So if you take this body of yours and you join it to someone who is not your spouse, in this case a prostitute, verse 16, you are joining yourself to them on a level deeper than just physical, on a level that is meant to be shared with no one else. You are mingling your life with theirs uh, in, in a way that, it, that is not just physically alone but involves the soul and the spirit as well. And the result is a corrupted intimacy that does not bring life but death. Like tearing little pieces of your soul away and joining them first to this one and then to that one and then tearing pieces of their soul away from them as well. It is an abusive intimacy. A false intimacy that is ultimately devastating spiritually. A false intimacy that brings brokenness on a personal level and ever deeper brokenness as it spreads throughout a culture like ours. I mean, if, if you don't think that's true, look around you today. The sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, what has that done for us? Are marriages healthier now on this side? Are families stronger now? Are children doing better? All across the board, the answer is no, no, no. That is why we need a Savior. It's why we must hear the warnings of Scripture and take them very seriously, which brings us third to this, to embrace sexual sin leads ultimately to a rejection of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you be holy in body as well as spirit, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in passionate lust like the Gentiles or the pagans who don't know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all these things. As he told you beforehand, and I solemnly warn you now, for God has not called us to impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Notice what he says. He says the life of the sexual idolater is the life of someone who does not know God, verse 5. Someone who by their choices and lifestyle has rejected God, verse 8. The rejection of God and, and, and pagan secular sexuality go in hand in hand. Uh, you, you, one always brings the other. And so you cannot choose a life of sexual sin and maintain any kind of fellowship with God. If you choose to pursue sexual immorality above God, listen, you lose God. And the result of losing God is eternally devastating. And again, look at the end of verse 6. What does he say? He says, the Lord is the avenger in all these things. He is the avenger. What does that mean? It means God's judgment falls eternally on those who refuse his creation design in their sexuality. To choose the idolatry of sex over faithfulness of God brings destruction. Friend, eternal 
misery is a terrible price to pay for the temporary ecstasy of sexual sin. That's exactly what he's saying. And again, let me just urge you, we must take the warnings of Scripture seriously. Listen to these warnings, just two. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the righteous, the unrighteous, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21.8, likewise, a little more explicitly. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Quite literally, and I say this because I love you, not because I don't. There is hell to pay for spurning God's design of sexual purity before marriage and faithfulness within marriage. So is there any hope here? Is there any hope? I'm going to go a few more minutes here because we, ha- we can't end there. You've got to hear the hope. What can you do? I could hear someone say to me, if I'm already guilty of sexual sin. Many of us have been and many of us perhaps are. What what can I do? Is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for sexual sinners? Is there any hope for sexual idolaters? Praise God, there is. Here's the last thing this morning then. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives sinners, all sinners, hope for restoration and real intimacy with God. Look back at 1 Corinthians 6. I read part of it. Let me read the rest of it because there's both the warning but also the promise. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, do you hear this? Do you hear what's being said here? Uh, Do you see that the beautiful, pure, holy church of Christ is not made of of people who've never sinned? It's not made of people who've never sinned these sins. He says, such were some of you. Some of these Corinthians had done these very things. Some of them had been prostitutes and abusers. They'd lived lives of sexual immorality. Corinth, as I told you, was known for these sort of things. These people had been sexual idolaters to the core, but they are no more. What happened? They heard the gospel of Christ and they believed it. They heard how he lived a life of absolute purity that they failed to live. They they heard how he went to the cross to die under the weight of their sin and to pay its awful penalty, how he rose on the third day in victory that could be theirs by faith. And so when they heard that good news, they believed it. They believed that his dying on the cross was enough to pay for their sin. They believed that his righteousness was enough to make them pure. And they cried out to him. They trusted him. And the result of trusting him, look what it says in verse 11. They were washed of all their filthiness. They were made holy where they had been unholy. They were counted righteous where they had been unrighteous. All of that by faith in Christ. The guilt of their sin was removed. And they were embraced by God and counted as holy, beloved children acceptable to Him through Christ and filled with the presence of His Holy Spirit to give them a new life. Listen, listen. You too can be cleansed and accepted and restored to God. That's the whole point of this. I mean, you may personally have committed terrible sins, all sins are terrible. My sins are terrible. You may have sinned the very sins we're talking about here. It doesn't matter. There is hope and salvation for you 
if you turn and run to Christ. There is cleansing for you if you trust in the good news of Christ. I'll close with this. One of my favorite scenes in the whole Bible is the scene in John 8 where Jesus is confronted by a crowd ready to kill a woman caught in the act of adultery. And some quibble about whether or not this belongs there in John and all that stuff. I think it's so much like Jesus that I accept it wholeheartedly. No problem. And so they... The enemies of Jesus drag this woman before him, throw her in the dust at his feet, this woman caught in adultery. Her accusers throw her there in front of him, ready to execute God's judgment against her sin. And, and, and according to the Old Testament, she, it's right, she's guilty. There's no doubt about it. They caught her in bed with her lover. She deserves to die under the Old Testament law. That's clear from the Old Testament. She was under condemnation for her sin, just as we are. But do you remember what Jesus says to her? After dispersing the crowd and sending her accusers away, here she is, just the two of them, her in her filthiness, condemned to die. Him in his purity, full of power. Jesus looks at her, and I believe with, with eyes of gospel compassion, he says to her, woman, where are your accusers? Is there, is there no one to condemn you? And she looks around, no doubt, seeing the love and mercy in, her, in his eyes for her, mercy beyond all comprehension. Somehow she knows her sins can be forgiven. And she looks around and she says, nobody, Lord. And Jesus, in the purity of his holiness, looks at her and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Friend, you, you can hear him say that to you. If you have trusted Christ, he has said that to you already. But no matter who you are or what you've done or what your wretched past may be, if you turn and run to Christ and trust him for what he has done on the cross and in his perfect life, if you cry out to him and believe the promise of redemption and the gospel, he says to you, you are not condemned. Get up on your way and sin no more. Turn from this life and trust me and follow me. And there is purity and cleansing and holiness. Let's pray. Well, Father, Father, it's a difficult, top, difficult topic to deal with because it touches so close to home. It's a t difficult topic to deal with because every one of us stand as sinners condemned under your judgment. Some for the overt sin of sexual misconduct, others for the quiet sin of pornography and inward lust, and many other things that we could name. We are all broken because of sin. But if we are broken because of sin, there is a redeemer from sin in Christ. So my prayer is that you would cause us to repent of our sin, to come clean before you, to run and to take hold of you who by faith can give us holiness and purity that is real and lasting. Oh, Father, for those who are trusting you, convince them that they are clean through Christ. And for those who are not yet trusting you, turn them that they may become clean in Christ. And give the holiness of a new life that stands in you and trust your gospel. Lord, nobody has gone so far gone that your gospel can't give them perfect cleansing and purity. Would you grant that purity as we trust in you? Would you deepen the intimacy of our marriages as we trust you daily and yield ourselves to you? Would you answer the cries of singles who hurt in this area? Lord, for the one who burns bringing a husband or a wife, not so they can satisfy their lust, but so that they can be joined with someone in a lifelong deepening intimacy. And where that doesn't take place, would you give the satisfaction of intimacy with Christ, that satisfaction which is enough, 
that we might live to the praise of your glory. Give us what we need as we look to you in Christ's name. Amen. Stand and let's go before the Father.